life cycle and their habitat. And he's a backyard beast, which is a company that he started in 2009 that uh, initially focused on urban hives and pollinating um, your all your gardens that grow inside the city. And he's expanded, and now he has a, quite a large apiary that he runs and does commercial pollination. And he's going to tell you a little bit about that. While he's talking, I'm going to hand out some evaluations. When the speaker is done, if you could just leave the evaluations in one pile on the table, I'll pick those up. They want me to be responsible for those. And um, he doesn't mind questions while he's speaking. But if you do ask a question, have it be something that he can answer uh, fairly succinctly so he can get back to his talk and we can finish on time. And so now, without further ado, here is Rob Renshaw and his honeybees. Can you all hear me okay? I haven't spoken into a microphone in a long, long time. Uh, thanks for having me this morning. Uh, I do want to point out, I brought some honey for everyone to taste at some oh, point yeah. if you want afterwards. There's a little garbage there. There's there's wildflower. This is from around Bellingham and that's um, what I call Mount Baker. It's mountain honey. And just to give you an idea that uh, we're going to talk about this, but um, honey is a botanical product and it just the flavor and the color and everything about it depends on the plants that the bees forage from. So uh, I'm going to give you kind of a, an overview, and I'd like to meet the needs of what you're interested in. Um, and so I can move through the stuff that I made slides about and info that I thought I would talk about. But before I go further, um, does any, do you guys have questions that are on your mind or you want me to cover um, from the get-go? Because I know you saw, I've heard some other things about bees. So yeah, go ahead. We had a question on our table after seeing the film this morning, right? And wondering about is it actual, actually feasible for us to no longer have these big bee movers and to have beehives that are local uh, and stay local, so that we don't have to have the carbon footprint of right. shuffling bees across the country? Okay, it's a good question. The answer is um, <laughs> it depends on a lot of stuff. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Let's say you like to eat almonds. You really like almonds. Most of the world's almonds are grown in California and the Central Valley, and it requires, as it puts the biggest demand on commercial beekeepers in the U.S. at a time of year when they don't have a lot of beehives. And if you, if these almond growers, people are like, well, why don't almond growers keep bees there? Well, if you have like a 25-acre almond farm in the Central Valley and you're surrounded by miles in the direction of more almond farms, you have fantastic nutrition for these bees for about five to six weeks. And then as soon as those go out of bloom, it's like a food desert for the bees. And so if you keep those, those colonies sitting right there in the orchard, you're gonna have to feed them something fake for 11 months of the year. Um, the alternative is put them on a truck at night and go to somewhere else. Um, and that's kind of the reality of it. If you have a couple of rows of blueberries you know, here in town, and somebody's got some highs across the neighborhood, that's, that's just fine, because there's great food diversity across town. Yeah, that's a good question, yeah. Can you put your mic closer? Oh yeah, you bet. Thank How's you. that? Yeah. Okay. That's been good. Uh, a question about the practicality of, of having my like, beehive in town or in a garden. I have, I have a little plot out in a community garden, and somebody out of the community garden put in three hives, and everybody was so freaked out about it that he had to remove them from the garden. And I thought that was a tragic mistake. But, but so how do you deal with bees in an urban environment? So urban's a little bit tricky. So like in the city of Bellingham, I'm not totally clear, but each like a municipality will have like laws about it. Like in Whatcom County, basically there's this right to farm. And if you live in the county, you put beehives and cows and whatever, just about. Uh, in town, I think there's a one or two hive per like, backyard yeah. limit, and I think, you know, unless you have your neighbor's permission, I think it's supposed to be like 50 feet from from neighbor's home. Uh, home. So, oh, yeah, sorry about that. I'm, I'm hoping to get better at this as we go on. Um, can you all hear me now? Yes. Okay. So, um, 
yeah, in terms of being in a community garden, for the most part, bees are very, very safe. They don't go out and sting people. I was actually going to, we're going to talk here about um, if it's a bee sting or if it's a wasp sting. It's, everybody always says a bee stung me, but I think most of the time, unless it's in your hand or foot, like you stepped on it barefoot, or you grabbed it with your hand, um, or you were messing with somebody's bee colony, it's probably not a honeybee that stung you. Maybe if you're on a bike or a motorcycle and goes into your sleeping or jacket, then maybe. So, uh, good. Well, let me uh, move along just a little bit here because uh, some of these are about questions about uh, what is a honeybee. So here's a picture of one right here. Is there a way to dim the lights for this area? I'll try not to stand in front of this. So there's a honeybee on a dandelion. Dandelion's like one of the first um, major food sources for the bees in the spring here in the Northwest that provide very good pollen and sufficient nectar for them to uh, build up in the spring. And so one of the things we want to do is just identify a honeybee versus the other things out there. There's something like 4,000 pollinators in, the, um, in North America. And honeybees, there's just a few types that are here. And most of them come from Europe and Russia and in between. Um, and they vary in color, but their general um, shape, size, and sort of pattern is the same. So they usually have a little bit of fuzz right here. And then they have these um, stripes. And they don't have alarming colors on the back of them. So I'll have a picture of a wasp here pretty soon. Um, and you're going to see it's like a like school bus colors. And usually wasps and, and hornets have very like alerting colors to them. Um, so I want to throw a question out there to you all. Does anyone know what this flower is? That's not a trick question. I, I just want to know. <laughs> yeah. I think this is responsible for the marshmallowy flavor in the mountain honey, but I'm not totally sure. So I, I wanted to check and find out. Uh, how about this? You guys know this plant? It's kind of close up. That's with an iPhone. So this is up uh, at about 6,000 feet near Lake Ann. Yeah, it's Heather. And I don't know if there's different Heathers that grow at al altitude versus down here, but. Um, late in the summer, I found a lot of bees on, on this. This one I don't know. Wild aster? Okay. And fireweed. This is far and away one of the most important bee plants here in the Northwest uh, in the summertime down here, but also at the elevation. And how about here? Okay, so blackberry has. Uh, it is the biggest honey producer here. It's the biggest food source. And um, recently, sometime this summer, someone pointed out that there's a lot of these ecology projects going on, on along streams. And blackberry is not native to the area. And they pull up blackberries and put in, I don't know, sometimes shrubs and small trees and such. And uh, this is the biggest food source um, here in western Washington. And maybe Western Oregon. Uh, and the pollen content is fantastic with bees. So, this is a much different colored bee than you saw before. This one's very dark. This is Russian. And uh, they're basically vary between like a, a black and dark gray colors. And, uh, but it's still on bee. And, uh, so most of the time when people get stung, and I think it's a wasp, usually if it's, uh, if it's actually a honeybee, you're going to have a stinger present, unless it's through a shirt. It's usually going to be barefoot, or maybe if you happen to grab one with the hand. Um, and if you're near a colony, most of the time they're going to try and sting you right in the face, because I think this is from being adapted to uh, bears over millennia. 
and that's about the only effective place it can sting a bear. And yet it still doesn't kind of keep bay, uh, bears at bay. Um, okay, so just a few things about bees and the economy um, that I've mentioned. So in the U.S., they contribute to about $29 billion in food crops. Um, and I was mentioning earlier, the almonds are the biggest part of that. That's about $2 billion. And every winter, and me included, um, in late January, bees from all over the U.S. get trucked to California to pollinate almonds. And it's a, a huge demand, and there's usually, that's the time of year where you, when you'll hear it in the paper and in the, in the media that, well, they're going to have enough bees this year because it's this large demand all at once. And it requires about one and a half million colonies. And uh, I'll send, you know, 130, maybe 150 colonies down there on a semi truck with another beekeeper uh, from Skagit Valley. And, um, yeah, they go down, pollinate, come back, they have a bunch of food and warm weather at a time of year when it's cold, rainy, and there's no food here, and they come back looking robust and, and pretty fit. Um, but they don't make other stops for the crops along the way. Um, um, about a third of all the food that we eat in the United States comes from things that were pollinated by honeybees. And there are other pollinators out there, and they're very effective at pollinating foods. As long as, like we talked about earlier, um, this is maybe in an urban setting or you have a small, you know, acre garden or something near the edge of the forest. Um, so, are there any questions at this point? About any of that? How yeah. long are they in California for the almonds? Uh, just long enough for the bloom. So, well, people do it differently, but uh, that runs for about six weeks, six weeks. depending on. Each individual type of tree might bloom three or four or five weeks, but then they have different, a couple different pollen or uh, excuse me, almond variations. So just a short while. Although beekeepers, like in Minnesota and um, the Northeast, will truck them to Texas and California just to put them somewhere a little more mild for the winter months. Yeah. How do you keep the bees on the truck during the day? Because it must take more than overnight to get to your destination. Yeah, that's a great question. So if they're coming from Florida, they go in a refrigerated truck. And so it's a, inside a box and the refrigeration's running the whole time. And uh, from here, you know, weather's terrible in January. So they will we'll load them up in the late afternoon and usually it's cold out. It sort of depends on the weather. And then the truck driver will go get dinner, park the truck, and at like four or five in the morning take off. And we'll drive for 12 hours straight and then park the truck in the dark again. Do you put a net over the truck? Yeah, they're required to, but uh, it's really unnecessary. Like they when I move bees the around the here, I don't put a net on or close them up or anything. Once we're there on the truck and have the wind and the vibration, they'll just kind of hang on and enjoy the ride. <laughs> I guess. Yeah. I've read some of the latest research, however, which says that the stress that the bees are you know, exposed to in long rides over and over again is damaging long term. What do you yeah. think of that? Uh, I think that's probably true. I mean, I think uh, just, yeah, hypothetically, it's, it seems like it ought to be. And um, I don't like to do much pollination and I don't like to move my, my bees much. And so uh, there's a lot of different businesses out there doing it differently. A lot, most of the commercial beehives out there are owned by a few businesses. And, and do commercial pollination, and that's what they do. And the honey they get is a small byproduct, and then they don't, they just sell it off in barrels, and then packing plants buy it, repackage it, and that's how you, when you find like the, the bear of, uh, you know, USDA grade A honey, and it doesn't say anything else about it, that's where it's from. And uh, yeah, but. So when bees have a choice, where do they prefer to colonize? Where are they most likely to build a hive? Um, well, that's an interesting, tough question. So, uh, are you talking about immediately, like somewhere? If they were going to choose a spot in my backyard, it okay. would be, say, in the sun, in the shade, where it's windy, where it's not. Yeah, windy. okay. So, in nature, uh, when a bee colony uh, splits and swarms, uh -huh. 
and they basically make two colonies, which we're going to get to here in a minute. Uh, they will generally choose a place that's high off the ground, usually a couple meters off the ground, with one entrance, usually facing south, and it's dry, and it would, you know, a thousand years ago, be in the hollow of a tree. Nowadays, an attic space or between the studs and your wall work fantastically, or a birdhouse, or old beekeeping equipment, any of these things will do the trick for them. So someone called me recently, uh, about two weeks ago, so they had a swarm in their yard, and usually when I get called about bees or swarms, they, I've quit going, unless someone sends me a picture, because it's usually wasps. Um, <laughs> and uh, this was actually, this is the only second time I've ever seen this, uh, sort of in this large shrubby tree, out in the thin little branches, the bees had built their wax combs, just oh, wow. hanging out there in the air, and it was still kind of, well, it was about two weeks ago. And uh, it was over a bunch of blackberries, and I, I didn't have time, so I called the Mount Baker Beekeepers Association, and they have a page of people who get swarmed. And this was not a swarm, it was a colony. Um, and they had just built their, their hive in the open branches. And I'd seen that one other time, uh, ever. And I think that's just, they swarm, they hang there, and their scout bees do not find a permanent place to move to. And so after a certain number of days, they just kind of give up and, and colonize that spot. Yeah, go ahead. So I bought my bees, and usually if you get bees, you gotta buy them from someone who has them, or catch a swarm, which sometimes works depending on when you catch it. Um, if you catch it early in the spring, it can build up and be a worthwhile colony that will live through the winter. And if you catch a, a swarm late in the summer, they don't have enough time or resources to, to store up enough honey and they'll, they'll starve to death in the winter. Or they won't build up enough bees and so, uh, yeah, you just are going to have to buy them from someone if you want to get the bees. Yeah. Um, so when you're trucking these bees down to California, are you just going and putting your hives anywhere? Are you contracting with the almond growers? Or how does that work? Yeah, so for me, uh, and people do it differently, these really large businesses have their own semi-trucks and move them down and place them. I have a bee broker who's in California. I don't know what he looks like. I speak on the phone. And uh, so I send my bees on a semi truck. And he receives it in the evening uh, at some spot off the freeway. And then they put the hives on a small truck and put them in the orchard that night. And then they sit on the ground for five to six weeks. And then they do this in reverse. Yeah. If you had like your, a small garden, Um, if you have someone who wants to put a hive there and they want to tend to it and take care of it and make sure it's in good health, this is a great idea. If if not, then I would say no, I would get mason bees or some other thing. And the reason is, if you're not really taking care of the honeybees and keeping a good eye and monitoring for health, uh, they can just be a health hazard to other honeybees. And the reason is, they like once they pick up, there's a couple of brood diseases like once they have these in their hive and in the comb, they're just like a constant source of, of disease. And bees will go sniff out that place, walk around in there, track it back to their own colony, which may be a nice strong colony. And in months, uh, the strong colony will, will die. And so, uh, yeah, old beekeeping equipment sitting around is just generally a poor idea. So, Do, do honeybees get mites? Yes, honeybees do get mites. And I'll show you a picture here pretty soon. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. So this is a wasp, a type of yellow jacket. And um, they prey on individual bees late in the season. They're also carnivorous. And they clean up dead bees and debris. And they'll sneak in hives and steal some honey and such. But this is not a honeybee. So, uh, What's it called? Uh, it's a yellow jacket. Okay. 
Um, so if you think it's honeybees, they're going to have wax combs, they're going to have light colors, and they're going to be in colonies. Um, and really the only time you're going to see them is on flowers, and that's about it. Uh, there's three types of honeybees in a colony. There's the queen, and then the worker bees, and drones. And we'll talk about each of those here. Um, and so they keep the, the brood nest at about 93 degrees all year round. And it doesn't matter, I'll show you a picture here pretty soon with some snow and some stuff. This is uh, just a few other items about the bees. So this is electron micrograph um, of a bee foot. And um, they have three claws, but that one's broken right there and kind of pushed over. But that's what the end of their, their legs look like. That's why they can hold on pretty well. Um, that is the bee eye. And these little things here are pollen grains sitting around on there. And those are hairs on the eye as well. And that is a stinger. And you can see there's two pieces to it. And you can see the barbs here. And so bee, honeybees can sting other insects. And because they have exoskeletons, they can sting repeatedly. They're not going to lose their stinger, but when they sting them, you know, a mammal, the skin, they're going to lose that stinger. And then the bee is going to die in the next 24 hours. Um, so usually people want to know how long bees live. So there's three types. And so let's talk about the queen and sort of her, her life for a little bit. So she's larger than the other bees. I think I got a picture here very soon. Um, so, and before I move on, there's two things. So the bees reproduce, but also the colony needs to reproduce. And um, so we'll talk about each of those. So here's a queen right here. And queens will live, it's typical to live like two years. Um, they say they can live three or maybe even four, though I don't know how productive that is and meaningful. Um, they're certainly in their first year of life much more productive. And when I say they're productive, the queen basically has two jobs in life. One is to, to mate, and she'll do this just after a few days of hatching. She'll go on two or three days of mating flights, mate maybe a dozen to 20 times, and basically store up um, what for a bee is a lifetime of sperm uh, in a, in a spermatheca. And she will then, after that, individually inseminate eggs as she lays them. And she can choose whether to inseminate them or not. And if she does, they turn into worker bees. And if she does not, they turn into haploid cells, which develop into drones. And that's how you get the male bees. And so she can individually choose. And they have uh, the cells in the brood nest where they're laying. Um, the eggs are two different sizes. They're sort of the typical honeycomb pattern that you see in their smaller cells. And that's where she lays all the worker eggs. And then the larger cells should lay the drone eggs. Um, interestingly, um, if a hive goes queenless at some point, for whatever reason, sometimes queens just die. Sometimes if she becomes unproductive, the workers will um, essentially have her, well, they'll feed some other eggs and larvae such that they develop into queens, and then they'll assassinate that they have. And that's just how the animal kingdom is. <laughs> and so um, they're kind of like, they're not going to put up with a lazy uh, CEO, I guess. I'm going to get right to it. So she, uh, I think she feels the pressure because she lays between 1,500 and 2,000 eggs a day. And when a queen is doing this, everything about this hive is going great, or it seems that way. Um, and queens that are not doing this, the, the colony is just kind of struggling all the time. And that's why beekeepers replace queens. Um, uh, so some bees are very good at identifying that and taking care of it on their own. And if they're not, the whole colony will suffer and dwindle and they probably won't make it through the winter. Um, I have a question. Yeah. Um, when, you, when you say you replace the queens, do you inseminate the queens you have to get new 
purchase new queens that you bring in? Yeah, so um, there's so I purchase queens. I don't rear queens. Mm -hmm. Mostly I'm focused on creating honey products. But there are beekeeping businesses that just sell bees, and there's beekeeping businesses that just rear queens. And so I have a couple of suppliers in California um, that I order queens from, and they come FedEx overnight. They leave there about 4 p.m. one afternoon, and they show up on my doorstep first thing in the morning. And uh, I've done it through the postal service, and the post office will call me at like 6 in the morning and say, your queens are here, come get them. Come to the back door. <laughs> I don't want to hold them. So, uh, are they some kind of pedigree, or, or um, do, are they just generic queens? Do you know where they're... Yeah, so everyone who rears queens is trying to rear queens that, you know, lay more eggs and have a genetic line that are um, hopefully more resistant to disease and usually focused on resistance to mites. Um, and how well they get this, it's hard to say. I do have a question, though. Give it your best shot. Uh, with these queens, does the hive know that that this is, I want to say, a newcomer to the hive? Um, yeah, they do. And um, so if you take a, a, a healthy colony and you take a new queen, comes in the mail in the morning, and you go out there and you try and introduce it, uh, they will just come kill her, like right now. They, they won't tolerate that in one bit. Uh, and so what you have to do is sort of trick them into the condition of, of accepting the queen. And usually what I'll do in the spring is take like a, you know, like nice sized hives, I'll split into two. So one half has a queen and one half does not. And I let them, the half that's not be queenless for about 24 hours, mm -hmm. maybe 48 hours. And in that time, they'll start trying to rear a new queen. They'll take eggs and build out long cells, and then when they develop into larvae, they will feed them extra royal jelly. And it's simply a larger cell and a change of diet that determines if a bee turns into a queen or develops into a worker bee. So once they're queenless, they're kind of happy to accept a new queen, and I would say 29 out of 30 times, uh, they'll accept her you know, readily, and uh, then she'll get to laying. So um, this was a photo, I, I wish I had a better lens when I took this, but this was from a swarm I found a few years ago. And after a couple of days, it was such a small swarm, it was maybe that big. Most of the time, a healthy swarm is like a volleyball, or basketball size thing of bees. I mean, sometimes you see swarms that are like two basketballs in size, but it's a very small one, and so I thought, I better check, see if they have a queen, I don't know what's going on. And I was looking around, looking around, and, and she's right there. And, um, and then I saw this little thing sticking out right here. I was like, wow, oh, what, what is that? She's got something stuck to her. And I've only read about this and never seen it, never seen a photo of it. And this is actually uh, uh, the drone penis sticking out of the queen. And when she's finished mating, the structure stays in her and she comes back to the colony and they actually remove it. And then she's not going to go mating ever again. And um, yeah, so it's kind of unique to see. Um, <laughs> we'll get to that in one sec. Okay, so that's the queens and their life, um, mostly. We're going to get to swarming in a second. So drones are only, the colony will only produce drones kind of in mid to late spring and then into the middle of the summer and then they quit. And the only purpose of creating drones is so that these drones can carry this colony's genetic material to mate with some other queen that's gonna be in some other colony. So the drones have no productive purpose for the colony that they live in. And um, so they mostly go on mating flights, come back, they get the worker bees to feed them. They're much bigger, they're loud, and uh, <laughs> Yeah, I don't have a lot of great things to say about the, the drones per se because they don't do much for my bees, but they are they do play a very important role. Interestingly, um, if you have a, a colony that goes queenless and is kind of dwindling in numbers because now it doesn't have you know a thousand or two thousand bees hatching every day, 
and, and the colony was unsuccessful at rearing a new queen in time, they'll, they'll keep having this, they have a brood nest, and basically the, the timeline between the egg being laid and that bee hatching is 21 days. And so if they go queenless, it's sort of this 21 day period where they could have no queen and they could have brood in there. And everybody sort of behaves as if, as if everything's normal because they can smell this brood and they call this this brood pheromone. And that kind of keeps everything feeling ordinary around the hive. And the minute that the last brood hatch or, or that they get near um, having being in a broodless state and don't have this pheromone around anymore, uh, the ovaries of the female worker bees will develop and then they will start laying eggs. And um, once this happens, if you're keeping bees, you cannot do anything to save this colony. You can't requeen them. They're kind of helpless at this point. But interestingly, they, they, their ovaries develop and they will lay eggs in cells all over the place and they will develop into drones. And then these drones can go out and mate and still pass on the genetic material of this colony. So this is a swarm. This is some bees and it's a raspberry field at the edge. And this is a swarm going on. And this I just got under it, took a photo straight up there. Um, so the swarm, the purpose of the swarm is to make two colonies or separate them. So let's say 10,000 years ago or 1,000 years ago, you have a tree in the forest and it's got a bee colony in it. And it's winter time and bee colonies eat their honey and they come out of winter and they're doing fine. And in another tree in the forest, there's a bee colony and a bear comes along and it eats the other one. So nature wants to replace this other colony. So bees do this by swarming. So before they're going to swarm, so they come out of winter and essentially every colony that comes out of winter is just destined to try and make another colony swarm. And so as soon as they build up to what they think is a sufficient size, they will rear many queens. And I'm talking, I don't know, 15 to 30 queens, uh, depending on the colony, because they're not going to hedge their bet on a single queen. And so they'll, they'll have all these queens that are developing, and queens develop in about 14 or 15 days, much faster. And as soon as, usually, in, in normal circumstances, um, as soon as they hatch, the first queen out will go around and sting all the other queens and kill them. And then at that point, as soon as they have what they feel is a good enough weather day, the mother queen of that colony, the queen that made it through the winter, she and about half the bees will take off in a swarm and it looks like a giant tornado. And it looks super dramatic if you haven't seen it before. And Usually if there's other trees around, they will stop 50 or 100 or 200 feet from the colony they just came out of. And then they'll, they'll all kind of hang together, uh, like you see right here. And most of them will wait. And then they have scout bees that are heading out for a mile, a mile and a half radius, looking for a new home. And if it's your little hole in your attic, or something in your chicken coop or some such thing, then as soon as they all decide where it's gonna be, then uh, they'll all take off again and, and fly to that new location and then they'll set up shop and uh, build out honeycombs and, and hopefully make it through the next winter. Can I ask a question on the picture on the right? Yeah. Uh, are the bears, the bears, the bees just clinging to each other? They are just hanging, yeah, exactly. And in the middle, right there, if you, you know, frequently when they're hanging like this, if I go to a bee yard and I see a, a swarm hanging in a tree, I can take, they usually take a cardboard box. In an ideal world, the swarm is about this high, and I can walk up to it <laughs> and put the box completely around it and give the branch a shape. And they're all hanging on one another. And I'll do this in shorts and a t-shirt. They, they're all carrying so much honey, they can't fly very fast, and they don't want to get involved with stain and all that. And they'll just fall in the box and they can't all come up and fly and you just put a lid on right then. And then you can take them to where you want to take them. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
take them. But uh, in the very center there, there's this kind of hollow, and I think the queen just walks around in there, and they feed her, and it's like holiday time for her, because she's not lame. <laughs> How are they clinging onto the branch, though? Uh, just with those, you know, a little uh, claw that I showed you earlier. Yeah. They can hold on to the side of a glass window with that little thing, or a branch, and I mean, there's a bunch of them hanging on the branch. I've seen them. Many times, it'll be in a bee yard and there's a swarm 30 feet up and they just can't get it. And uh, they'll break the branch and the whole thing will come down to the ground and then they'll all fly back up and grab where the branch broke. And so uh, they hang on, but sometimes they're, they're a little too much weight. Um, like this thing's quite a ways out of the way. This last summer we took a, it was actually a hive it was in a tractor trailer between the outer wall and the inner wall. It was up about uh, 70 feet. It was unbelievable. <laughs> nice, a swarm hanging like, there. Yeah, you should have been a circus performer. When those um, bees do what you said and, and they move off, or what you did and got them in the box, right. those bees that are out looking for a place, yeah. and they come back here and they're not there. What happens to them? Yeah. Well, I thought of that a long time ago. So every time I catch one, shake it in a box, put a lid on. Usually there's a hole in the box, or make sure there's a hole. And I'll just leave it there, and that'll come back in a couple of nights. Usually that night or the next one, because the ones that are still flying around right here, they'll they'll smell them and go in. And so then you can really get every bee. So here's a queen, right here in the center, and she has this. She's about the same width as everybody else, but her abdomen is much, much longer so that she can back into a cell and deposit that egg right in the back of it. I'll show you a few pictures. If you went on beekeeping, you constantly want to know if your colonies are queen right, and you don't go looking for the queen because there's like 50,000 bees. Um, there are times to look for the queen, but ordinarily I just go looking for the eggs, and if you see the eggs and they look like nice and organized like this, then you know the things in good shape. <clears throat> so you can see right here, these are pollen um, <clears throat> deposits, and uh, this is very important when they organize the inside of the hive. They have the brood nests, the eggs and larvae and pupa are all developing, and in a band right around them. Like usually, uh, you know, most people keep hives in boxes. But they keep the shape of the brood nest, like a sort of an oval basketball. And they'll keep like a band of pollen about an inch thick around the whole thing because that's what the, the nurse bees are eating and then feeding to the uh, developing larva. Um, so I'm getting a little distracted here. But uh, so, one last thing about the, the individual bees' lifespan. So, worker bees uh, live sort of a varying life, and it depends when in the year that you hatch. So if you hatch in, say, late September, October, early November, you are gonna live through the winter probably into March and April, and you'll be a much larger, fatter bee, and mostly the purpose is to be a reservoir of food for the developing larva in the late winter after the solstice, and just to maintain heat and have a strong immune system for that kind of waiting out period. Once spring comes and they start foraging, um, bees will only live, you know, maybe six to eight weeks is kind of typical. Like they just work themselves to death. And it's the very oldest worker bees that do the nectar foraging because it's the highest risk. You're flying away from the hive all the time. And so at this point, they don't, uh, after about two weeks, the worker bees do not eat, um, consume any pollen anymore and their immune systems are dependent on having this source of pollen. And so it's very clever because they're not, the bees who are most vulnerable to dying from disease or whatever are spending the most time out of the hive and most likely to either get weak and not make it back or get sick and stay out there or get eaten by something and it's less lost to the colony. Um, sort of the, the progression for a worker bee in their life, they 
So it takes them 21 days to hatch from, a, from an egg. After this, they're just a house bee. They do some cleaning. Maybe they feed the queen. Um, the, their wax glands are working quite well, and so they'll produce wax and fix up wax that needs built and cap off larva. And then after this, they become a nurse bee, and they consume large amounts of pollen. And then they feed this secretion, which I'm sure you guys have heard is uh, royal jelly, to the developing larva. And they actually feed them, I think it's something like 100 or 200 times a day, like each larva. Like they just keep coming back and back and back. And so it's really important in a brood nest to have these nurse bees. Um, <clears throat> Um, I think they do. I don't know how to read it, but I guess they do. And it's interesting, it's kind of dy dynamic also, because you, if um, they've done studies where they'll remove all the foragers from a hive, and very quickly, like in a day or two, all these bees that are very young will step up and become foragers. And if they didn't have to, they wouldn't move up to that um, promotion, I guess. Um, and vice versa, if you go in and remove a bunch of nurse bees, uh, very quickly a whole bunch of foragers will start eating pollen again and, and hang around the brood nest and feed larva. <clears throat> yeah, move along here. So these are some larva, and you see them very shiny here. That's the royal jelly on them. And these are probably at about, no, day five or six. So they sit there as an egg for day one to four. And then day four, you see them curled up and in a little pool of royal jelly. And then they get larger for about three days. And after that, the bees cap them off with wax. And they sit there for 14 days. And, uh, and then they hatch on their own. They eat their way out. And again, you can see the pollen right here. And pollen is very, very important for the bees. Um, if you see like pollen for sale somewhere, beekeepers put pollen traps on the hive, and when the bees go through this, the pollen falls off, and and then they collect that. But essentially, when you do that, you're stealing away their protein and fat source. So, um, you know, the colony uh, definitely pays a little bit for that. So this is uh, after they've been capped off. These ones have already hatched here. And there's a larva, or a, a bee, essentially, at this point. They'll all hatch at the same time in the same area. So this one's hatching out, crawling out. They look all fuzzy and small when they first come out. And it takes them about two weeks for their stinger to fully develop and the poison sac to develop. And so they won't become a guard bee for at least two weeks. You'll never see any bees that are outside the hive. You see them on the flower anywhere. They're older than two weeks at least because they just simply won't do that without the stinger being developed. And you can see she's getting a meal right away. So people often ask me, what do you do with your bees in the winter? Do you put them inside? Do they go to, I think a lot of people have the impression that bees go to California in the winter because they can't survive here. And um, though this seems like a really big threat, and, and honestly, I have to tell you, when I see this, I feel a little bit of like stress and like, oh, I hope they're okay out there. But um, they handle the cold just fine. And I've gone around to them on days when it's 25 degrees out. And uh, they are packed in there so tight. And they're moving just a little bit. And they basically do like penguins do. But they maintain this, um, although they get to make a three-dimensional circle um, or orb of bees to maintain their heat, but they tolerate cold just fine. And they can, I don't know to what temperature they can tolerate, but I've seen it get down to, um, what is it, 12 or 13, usually in the middle of December here a few times, uh, with snow on them, and they're just fine. <clears throat> In some locations where you get sustained cold, like for a week and a half, say, and it's zero degrees out, the bees will starve to death, even though the honey is like a millimeter away. 
they just, it's so cold and they're packed so tight, they just can't move over. And so if the temperature doesn't kind of come up and give them some relief, they just starve in a hive that has 70 or 80 pounds of honey in it. Yeah? Is there, yeah, I see different hive or box types. Yeah. What should, you know, if you're thinking about doing one, why is there one that's better for certain purposes or? Yeah, that's a great question. Did everybody hear that? Oh. Um, why is there a certain shape to a hive and does it matter what shape it is? And um, the answer is, so um, in like the 1850s, this guy Langstroth came up with sort of our modern day hive. And I don't know if it was the exact same dimensions, but it had all these removable frames. And that is a huge benefit um, for beekeeping, for being able to easily get in, see what your bees are doing and put it back together without crushing it up. Prior to that, people were still keeping bees in baskets and these sort of things. And when you wanted to harvest the honey, you ended up breaking up the nest quite a bit, sometimes killing the colony, and there wasn't a safe way to do that. Um, do the bees care? They don't. All they care is that it's between about 15 and 45 liters in volume. And 15 is really on the small side, but if you're like at 30 or 40 liters of volume um, and it's dry, they're happy. And um, it doesn't matter if it's a bird nest or this, or there's these things called top bar hives, which a lot of people say, oh, I do organic gardening and I have a top bar hive, and this is more biodynamic, and I'm not sure what it means, and I don't think the bees care at all whether they're in a top bar or a square hive or in a barrel for that matter. All they care is that they have enough volume to build those combs out and that it's dry and that they have sufficient air supply. And um, it does have to have, ventilation is very important. At a time like this, when I go lift the lids off, usually it's dry right in the center, right over them on the lid, but the rest of the sides of the hive and back and all of that are just soaking wet from their uh, respiration. And um, so I have vents in the bottom and vents in top, and it doesn't matter if it gets cold in there, but they need some way for that moisture to move out. So, yeah, great question. And in a tree, it doesn't matter the tree shape as long as it has enough space. Um, okay, so real quickly here, I said I'd talk about threats. So there's a couple big ones, pathogens. Um, the, the biggest thing I bet you've heard of it is Varroa mites. And I've got a picture. Um, so that's a threat to an individual bee wasps and other insects and birds and stuff like this, but there's not enough birds and not enough hornets and not enough spiders to really be a threat to the colony. So this little bugger is a Varroa mite, and it looks like a crab, but it's very, very small. Like you take a ballpoint pen and put a little mark on your paper, just pick it up, it's about that size. So you can see them with just your bare eye when they're against the larva like this, because they're such contrasting colors but otherwise very difficult to see. And the mites actually reproduce underneath the capped brood. And so one of the things that I like to do for like integrated pest management is I do this thing called um, uh, mite trapping. And the mites preferentially go to the drone brood because drones gestate for two days longer and they can get one more mating cycle in the, the burrow the mites can. And so I like to cut these out and throw them in the woods for the birds to eat. And I don't, not 100% of this, but it's something I just try and stay on. And that eliminates physically a whole bunch of mites. But mites are responsible, um, they're probably the biggest economic cost to the beekeeping industry currently. Um, they also transmit a whole lot of viruses, so it's not just the mites that are sucking the lymph from the bees, but they also pass viruses along from bee to bee and uh, this will also decimate colonies. I don't have pictures of the others, but there are tracheal mites, there's foul brood, there's this gut bacteria that causes like dysentery in the bees in the winter time when they can't get out flying enough. And uh, these are all real things and they've been there for a long, long time. People ask me about uh, colony collapse disorder, and I don't think I've really seen colony collapse disorder. Um, you know, apparently it's where most of the adult bees disappear from the hive. There's a brood nest, there's a bunch of brood, 
a queen and a small few amount, you know, maybe a few hundred adult bees, and that's it. And the colony just can't survive at that point. Um, so anyway, there's pathogens, the, there's pesticides, fungicides. I think there's a lot of speculation now that um, fungicide buildup in the comb may be in part responsible for colony collapse disorder or just the fact that bees are having a hard time tolerating sort of these known pathogens that I just mentioned. Um, and when you think about it, it, it makes good sense. When you look at this larva, it is developing its nursery is this little wax cell. So the queen comes, lays an egg, then they feed it, it develops there for 21 days, and they clean it out, and the next day, the queen comes by, lays another egg, and this goes on and on and on. And the bees build up this wax. Anything the bees track back on their feet and fly into the hive or is sticking to them and is lipophilic, meaning it dissolves in, in oily substances, is happy to just attach itself to that wax and stay there probably forever. So if you have fat-based pesticide, fungicide, whatever contaminant, it's just gonna build up, build up. That concentration is only gonna go skyward. And I have to believe that after that wax has been around for 10, 20, or 30 years, that it probably has a lot of this stuff built up in it. And now this place where they're laying eggs and the larvae are developing, you know, may not develop normally. Does anybody have any questions about that? Yeah. Well, not about that, but <clears throat> I work out at uh, Hovander Park in the Pernell Gardens, and uh, last year I saw uh, in the early morning um, a number of bees that were just like lethargic or they sh shake a little bit and they be on the ground. And I was concerned because um, of uh, pesticides. Uh -huh. Could that be, be that? I tried to think like <clears throat> if the bee flies back to the hive and by the evening, they shouldn't be affected by the cooler yeah. weather in the morning uh, because they would be all warmed up. And right. around and fed and everything. Well, <clears throat> could it be a pesticide that would cause that? Or so, it was on, on the roses? So there's a couple things. Bees do go out and get too tired and don't come back that night. And okay. so they come back in the morning after they warm up. But they gotta wait for the sun to yeah. get them warmed up because they just can't produce enough okay. heat of their own. So um, usually when you see pesticide kills, um, at least with beekeepers see it, it's around their hives and they'll see a whole bunch of bees crawling around and the tongues are sticking way out and yeah, they're shaking and not walking normally and things like this. But um, you can find bees out that are just getting to the end of their life. They've been working to death for weeks and they just wear out and that's, that's a natural part of nature. But not a, whole, a whole bunch in one spot? Yeah, I'm not so sure about that. Hard to say. <clears throat> um, so the last thing that's a major threat, and especially now, is poor nutrition for bees. And uh, when we were talking about, do you have to truck your bees? Um, no, you don't, depending on where you live. But um, and I think a lot of places in Europe, they don't have to. There's places in the United States you don't have to. Um, but they need to have sufficient nutrition. And with bigger and bigger ur uh, suburban areas and urban areas, and bigger and bigger monocultural plots, um, it leaves less and less habitat for the bees. And um, some of these things are really tough, and I don't know how you would immediately solve them, but to talk about like opportunities to change one thing, like if you think about Skagit Valley, I read the other day that Skagit Valley produces all of the world's commercially available cabbage seed, like all of it, uh, not part of it, and they require bees to pollinate all that. So they have huge, huge plots of cabbage seed, and um, they bring bees in for that. You can't just leave bees there, but you need the bees to do this, so then, then they have to be on a truck. And I, I don't know how to, uh, I'm not sure how you solve that sort of 
thing. And there's several other crops that are like that. And I'm not totally certain of the nutritional value of cabbage seed uh, on its own, but even if it's great, it's only going to sustain the bees for you know five or six weeks while it's in bloom. Um, so last, I just I wanted to put this slide up here. This is a great looking box of bees. That's uh, usually people keep things in two brood boxes, one, two, and these brood boxes together make are about 40 liters in volume. And this is what the bees live in year round. When there's a honey flow on in the summer and late spring, you need to give them additional space to put that surplus honey away. And, um, and then when the summer's over, you can take that surplus honey off. And they've already packed around a whole bunch of honey down here. But this is a nice looking box of bees. This is really healthy. You can walk up, take the lid off, and go, everything's right here. And uh, feel good about that. Uh, so, you know, there's some, yeah, go ahead. How do you decide how much honey to take? Um, so, first of all, um, the bees won't put away honey on, like if you go put additional boxes on, they, they won't put honey in there until they've put sufficient honey downstairs. And then they're like, well, we gotta start putting it in the attic. And then they'll just go up, 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 and up. And so I never take it out of these boxes. These are just off limits. Um, and so I only take the, the stuff off the top. And then later in the summer, <clears throat> If I catch a swarm in July, it only has three weeks of honey flow to like grow, that colony is not going to make it through the winter. They don't have enough food. So they'll do one of two things. I'll either steal honey from a strong hive that's loaded with honey, or I'll feed them. And you just feed them sugar syrup. I'll mix it up with you know cane sugar and water and feed it to them so they can put some stores away and hopefully make it through the winter. Some of the time that works and some of the time it doesn't. And when it works, it's great. When it doesn't, then what you get, but when you feed it to them, you know, I, you know, you only feed it to them in these boxes, and you're never taking anything out of out of here, and so that leaves no chance for it to end up in your human honey supply. Do you rotate those boxes at all? Uh, yeah, they get mixed and matched all the time through the season. I mean, ideally not, but say, let's say I come to this bee yard and I open the lid off this hive right here. And there's not too many bees, there's five frames of bees, and they have no queen. Then I'll maybe steal the queen and a bunch of bees out here, put them in there, and let this one raise a new queen. Or if it's in the spring and early summer when I have a whole bunch of queens with me, I'll just mark it, come back a few days later, and introduce a queen. And, but uh, sometimes the boxes and the frames get interchanged, and that's why, like, for what I'm doing, having removable frames is essential. Um, so a couple of things to leave you with as far as opportunities for bees. They need more habitat, not less habitat. And people love cutting their lawns, and I cut my lawn, but if you can let the dandelions grow, that makes a big difference to the bees. Not just honeybees, but other pollinators. Um, think about what you can do besides chemical control of weeds, pests, so on. And I think I got the impression from looking at the displays here but there's a lot of discussion about how to do that here. I think that's really cool. Um, and, uh, you know, if it's possible to support more diverse farming methods, this also helps. But I don't know where to get it all, and that doesn't come from California. So um, it is just one of those things. So I think we have just a few more minutes, so let's take the rest of the questions. Yeah? When these forage, how far will they fly away from the um, so it depends how far you want to make them fly. Typically, it's about a two-mile radius, which a two-mile radius from one spot will cover about 12 square miles. Um, if food is scarce, they'll fly further, and if it's plentiful, they'll stay closer. They're not going to just go do the distance just because. And in fact, each day when things get started, you have scout bees going out looking for food, and if they're not finding it at that time, it'll be nice and warm, and the bees are all sitting around kind of like waiting <laughs> and then when, they, when the flowers decide, like, hey, it's time to go, the bees start going crazy. And they're waiting on the flowers to feed them. And it's this very integrated relationship they have. 
Um, they will, they have done studies where they go out on a like just a deserted island, just all rock, no plant material, and they'll put a bee colony out here and they'll bring out like a dish of sugar water and see how far they can get bees to fly to it. And they'll get them to fly up to seven miles round trip. But when they're flying four miles for that sugar water, that's similar in sugar concentrate, uh, you know, concentration to nectar. Um, the bees will lose weight as a colony when they're flying four miles and further. Does that make sense? Yeah. So if you put a hive on a scale, and you can see this, there's pictures of, I would really like to get one of these big base scales to put a hive on, because apparently there's times in the summer where we will put on 20 pounds in a day, and uh, yeah, it's quite incredible. They work yeah. it all off. Yeah. Um, in the spring, when, um, like say the cherry trees, or any of the fruit trees are blooming, and um, you know, it's raining right. around here, it seems like the bees are not flying, and the pollination is not nearly as high, and the crop <clears throat> is not as nearly as good. Right. Now what can you do about that? Um, that specifically, I'm not sure. If you have insect pollinators closer to your trees, that helps. Because when you think about the, the colony of bees, they have a brood nest to take care of. Yeah. It's not just people going and getting the food. So they're inside, they have the majority of the bees are feeding larvae and taking care of the brood nest. And so when it's sort of marginal temperature, like 60 and raining, it takes more bees to stay home to maintain that temperature. So you get fewer foragers. So if you got fewer foragers, you're probably gonna, if you drew like a big circle around this hive, like a couple hundred yards, probably have fewer foragers who are making it outside whatever radius you're looking at. So if you have pollinators closer, like if you have a friend who wants to put a beehive near your house, or you have um, mason bees do a great job on cold weather days in spring, this can be very beneficial. I think I've heard with pear trees, they put something on pears to get the bees to pollinate them. Like bees are very resistant to pollinating pears, like they don't naturally like the smell. It has good pollen, the pollen quality is good, but um, there's something about it that they, they don't naturally what like. What I've it. done with my pear and plum in the past couple of years is I don't have any, I have um, wild cherries, and that seems to pollinate our, you know, they're back a few hundred feet. But the pears, I've taken a branch off of one from a far distance, put it in some water next to my pear tree uh -huh. for my small pear. And and the same with plums, because there's no pollinators nearby. But um, my neighbor has one, so I, I've done that, go snag a branch and put it in water right next to my tree. Now this year I've got a tremendous <laughs> plum crop. I think crops in general this year were fantastic, yeah, and I think it was because of the beautiful spring weather yeah. and the fantastic pollination that happened. Right. Yeah. If bees are so, so, so gentle and, and, and kind and, and loving, why is it that you see all the beekeepers dressed up in their shields and paraphernalia, and what's with the smoke? Great questions. Um, so, so getting stung is unpleasant. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I get stung a lot, and I, I generally don't wear a big suit and stuff, and I, I, I think I'm a little bit careless, so I get stung more than others, but I, I know some other beekeepers who will zip up and all that before they even get to where they can see their bees in a bee yard. Um, in the middle of the summer when the honey flow is on and the bees are bringing in lots of food, I will literally go beekeeping in shorts and a t-shirt and just wear sunglasses to protect my eyes and I seldom get stung doing that. And I think it's one of those things like when the economy's good, everybody's happy. <laughs> and the bees are like that. And, um, yeah, and when it's not and the temperature's poor and they're not bringing in food, they can be a bit unruly. And they, they have a pheromone that they put out there that is basically gets everyone aggressive once you get stung once. So usually you don't get it once. Like once in a while I'll get one sting, maybe two stings. Mm -hmm. Then the other times I'll get stung like nine times or 20 times because 
they, they decide they all want to get in now. Do you yes. find that there are, oh, oh sorry, more okay. aggressive hives? And there definitely hives. are. I was with my son, we moved uh, colonies up to Mount Baker, just below the ski area. This was in the middle of the summer, it was hot, hot night. Bees don't really care if they're inside or on the outside of their hive, yet, you know, when it's warm out. And uh, so we, we didn't get up there until two in the morning, and then we put them on the ground, and then we camped. We got up the next day and built the hot wire fence, all this, and then we had some honey on those hives we needed to take off. And I had 32 colonies, and everything's going great. My son and I are working, and I get to like the fifth one from the last, and they just decided like they had something to settle with me. <laughs> and I think this is the first time I've like walked out of the yard, and my son, he's 15, he just thought this was great. <laughs> <laughs> so, yes. I, I don't know what was with that one, but um, yeah, go ahead. Um, I was, my yard out in Ferndale a couple years ago, I was having a problem with yellow jackets, and I don't have my yard in town, I have no problem. I just saw honeybees all summer long. But um, they would get under the eaves of my house and uh, the yellow jackets, I, as I believe, and so that's kind of what, where my question is, because I don't ever want to spray a honeybee in my life and you know that was part of my um, intrigue with wanting to know about bees I want to always make sure I'm if I have to do something with the bad guys because those uh, yellow jackets can really be aggressive and make it very difficult to yeah. garden and be outside but so under the eaves they make those little it looks like a honeycomb like a paper wall yeah. uh, paper nest so is okay. that always a yellow jacket that would That's do that yeah. always not okay. honeybee Okay, and then also going under the ground, um, if I, I saw a, a hole going under the house, that's always a yellow jacket too, right? A honeybee? No, one? bumblebees will be underground too. Okay. Bumblebees are fantastic pollinators. Okay. If you guys, if anybody does blueberries, blueberry, and actually a lot of your, to your question of like things that you can do for early pollination, uh, bumblebees are really important here. So, are we getting, uh, is this the end? we got about eight more minutes. Oh, okay. Do you guys want to keep going and use up your break? Well, we'd like to know where we can buy your honey. Oh, yeah. So, uh, <clears throat> you're welcome to buy my honey. Um, you should taste it first, <laughs> though. Uh, there's two there. One's marked Wildflower, and the other's Mountain. That's from up there by Mount Baker. And uh, I sell out the farmer's market on Saturdays. And I have a stand there every weekend. And then it's at the, both co-ops and... So that's those are places in Billingham. Yeah. Uh, this may have already been asked, but how much does a healthy bee box weigh? Like the picture you showed of that. Really that's a great question. This is a tough part of my year. I, at the end of the year, it's so hard to finish up what I'm doing, and it's really important to go into winter with each of these colonies weighing a lot. And so I literally walk around to all of them, lean over them and give them a little heave. And if I can barely sort of nudge them, they're heavy enough. And I don't know the exact weight. I know that um, the semi-truck that drives them to California in usually late last week of January, first week of February, they have scales built into the truck. So when they put 400 colonies on the truck, you can figure out like per colony what that is. And they're about 125 pounds per colony plus the piece of pallet that they're on sort of tough because there's all woods saturated with water at that time of year and all that but they're they're heavy i mean i would say the whole thing's over 100 pounds and they i think they have 60 to 80 pounds of honey inside them so, so yes do you keep yours over winter they're in your at your farm or whatever. yeah so i got two at my house here in the sunny land neighborhood okay. um and they'll over winter there and then i have them out like lummy peninsula Axton Road, I have Mount Marine Drive, out on Y Road, and they'll sit there. Basically, I want them out in the open where they, in those winter months when we get a little bit of sun, I want them to get all of that, you know, if we get it, so. But they just sit out there and they get rain and snow and put up with it. And if it gets warm enough, they'll, they'll come out, poop, go back in, shuffle around, eat, and then hunker down for the next go of cold. Aren't you worried that somebody will steal your hives? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I am. I have two locations. I have a lease with the city and a lease with the county. And both places have a locked gate. And then my other locations are on private property 
mostly kind of out of sight, but I've got a good trade of honey with the homeowner, and they like having them. And, but yeah, it does concern me a little bit, because it does happen, and they, they will sit for long periods of time unattended. You said something about taking care of the bees. One thing you said is if somebody has a hive, somebody needs to take care of it. Yes. And then the other thing you said was you never remove the, the comb inside of it. The wax stays there for a long time and pesticides might build up. Do you retire a hive after about five years and sanitize it or something? Yeah, so the colony I never get rid of. I mean, I have a certain loss of colonies. Like I counted up last week. I always count sometime in October and then I count again for almonds and then I count again like middle of April right before queens come. And I'll lose 15 to 20 percent of my colonies between now and when queens come in the spring and I can do anything about helping out a colony that lost its queen or is sort of dwindling. Um, in terms of old comb and that sort of thing, yes, I'm in the kind of a constant state of when I find comb that looks like it's been around for a long time, I throw it out. When it has brood in it and a whole bunch of baby bees that are going to hatch and all that, it stays in there and maybe I'll move it to the outside of the hive and the next time it comes Make out, it less desirable for them. So, I mean, so they won't lay eggs in it again, maybe mm -hmm. it'll have honey, but if it has honey then I can just set it up in the bee yard and all the bees will rob it out. Mm -hmm. okay. And so this is the deal with like having an old hive sitting around is that bees, bees can easily sniff out another hive or old comb. And that's why if you have an old bee box sitting around, bees frequently move into it because after they've swarmed, they're looking for a new place and they're like, well, it's the right size and there's already some comb in there and all that. And so then they move in and then they, you know, if there's disease in that box, they, they get that. So I, if you have that sitting around in the barn, toss it. If there's pesticide in the wax, right. will there be pesticide in the No, I would think that it would just stay in the wax. You know, if it's like a fillet, it's going to stay in the honey. Uh, you know, the honey is water and sugar and a small bit of other stuff that's water soluble. Uh -huh. We had a swarm that came in and settled in the tree in the woods. And is that a problem No. No, swarms are fine. They're going to move on. They'll stay for a matter of hours no, to. No, no, no. Oh, they're living in the tree? No. I mean, it's just nature doing its thing. And the nice thing about a tree is it'll fall down someday and break up and it'll end. I mean, it won't go on for on and on and on. Nobody keeps putting paint on it and maintaining it. So, <laughs> so that's the great thing about nature also. Um, are we... Yeah, let's, let's wrap it up and give everybody okay. a chance to taste the honey. So, and if you'll please fill out the, the Yeah, feel free to taste honey. 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 I'll hang around a few minutes if you guys want to chat a little bit more about anything. Thank you.